Cell phones, okay? <laughs> we don't want any interruptions, and we're going we're to try to have a good flow, so we'll save questions for the end, unless it's something that's so pressing that you're just popping out of your kishkas, okay? And you can't, like, control yourself. You have to ask the question. Um, okay. So we're on? We're recording? Yes. So welcome, everybody. Welcome our viewers on Torah Anytime. So happy to have you all. Okay, so we're starting with the Pasuk, the verse on, uh, it's uh, chapter 32, Perak Lama Bey's Pasuk Ches. It says as follows. Vayira <coughs> Yaakov Ma'od. Yaakov was exceedingly frightened. The very few times the Torah used the word Ma'od, Mem of Dalad, which denotes the fact it means very, extreme. The Torah is known for its brevity, to be very terse and concise. And uh, if it uses a word, an extra word, mm -hmm. it means to imply that Yaakov was very frightened. Vayetzerlo, and he was not only frightened, but it distressed him. So the Chos of Lublin says something fascinating. He says, we're talking about Yaakov, mm -hmm. who was the epitome, the personification of faith. Yaakov went through so many ordeals. He persevered through so many struggles. And to be alive, when you're a person... You're not a stick or stone when you're a human being. It means you're going to be subject mm -hmm. to tests. That's what being alive is about. Sometimes those tests are easy to handle. Sometimes those tests seem almost insurmountable and seem to be so gigantic and so huge that you feel so overwhelmed that you don't know what to do. But you have to understand that any test that you go through, don't think that it's the first time a human being has gone through that test. One of your ancestors, may have been Avram, and may have been Yitzchak, may have been Yaakov, Somebody in our family went through those tests and passed it and opened the doors for you to be able to pass the test in turn. So you're not living in a vacuum. You're living with a heritage. You're living with a history. You're living with a legacy. Those that came before you that forged a path. And anytime you're confronted with a tribulation, anytime you're confronted with a nisoyon that seems to be so difficult, just think about it and say, my great, great, great grandfather, my ancestor, he went through it, or she went through it, and survived, and allowed me now to face that struggle and temptation. So don't worry about it. But says the Chos of Lublin, something amazing, that if Yaakov was the bastion of faith, then how could it be, Vayira Yaakov, why was he so frightened? Now, it's understandable that any human being would be frightened if he's confronted by a whole army. By, first of all, remember, Esau is his nemesis. Esau is his mortal adversary, his enemy. The man said explicitly that he wants his brother Jacob Yaakov dead. Now he's there, facing him in battle. He has throngs and throngs of soldiers with him. Yaakov sees it. Remember, Yaakov is a shepherd. Yaakov is a gentle person. Yaakov is a scholar. Yaakov is the greatest Torah scholar. How many years did he spend learning Yeshiva Shem Ve'eber? He spent years learning, right? And he was a man... Who, as it says, even before he went to Yeshiva Shem Weber, the Torah depicts him as somebody that was tum, that, somebody that was pure, simple, that was Yoshev Ohel, that sat in the tent. He wasn't a warrior. He probably had a long beard, and it probably looked like this aged Rosh Yeshiva. You can see a picture of Steinman or of Chaim Kaneski. That's right, Yaakovit. Yaakovit first got married at 84 years old. You know, by this, anybody that's a little older and still not, not married, don't worry. Yaakovit you know, got married at 84. And, like, and, he had, and he had at least, you know, 12 kids, 13 kids, right? And probably many more. So it's okay, but, same, but he was an old man at this time. So he was no warrior. He was no combatant. He was no soldier. So of course, it's understandable he should be frightened. But what do you mean? He has a promise from God. So therefore, it says the Chos of Lublin that it says that he was frightened. He was very scared. Vayetzerlo, distressed. Distressed doesn't mean that the fear was compounded. It says the Chos of Lublin, what distressed him was the fact that he was frightened. Because he understood he should have had more faith. Isn't that deep? No, no. Parshib Shah, Vayur He was very scared. He had this palpable fear, this apprehension, this anxiety. This, this tremendous, tremendous, he was petrified. By alone, he was also distressed. No, it's not. He was distressed because he was frightened. Because a Jew has to live with faith. That's what makes us special. Is that we, always, we understand that Hashem loves us. Hashem puts us through something. That's what we need. We may not be able to conceive or fathom why, but we don't know who we really are. You think you know who you really are? You have no idea who you really are. We don't know who, what our soul is. So that's why Yitzhak alone. But suffice it to say, it says he was very afraid. 
All right, let's learn Pasha Pshat. Simple translation here. He was very frightened. Why was he so scared? So Rashi says, Vayiro Sheme, he was afraid lest he be killed. He was afraid he would die. What do you mean? He has faith. But so, the Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, the Maril Diskin, who's so holy, you got to read about him if you don't know. Anybody that doubts the fact that there's a God, read about Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. And you'll see, you'll see it's, it authenticates the fact that this is Isha Lokim. There's a man of God and there has to be a God. If there's a man of God, there's a, there's a God. He was angelic, Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. He says that there was a prophecy that Rebecca Rivka Imenu said. And she said that both her sons, her twins, will die on the same day. So Yaakov Vino says, listen, if I have to get engaged in some kind of combat with him and he has to die, it means that if he dies, I die. So that's where he's afraid that he would be killed. And and he was distressed lest he have to kill others. Now, there's a question that all the Rishonim, all the Mephorshim ask. Why is he afraid of calling others? He has a halachic rationale. He has a halachic justification. He's allowed to kill others. Why is he allowed to kill others? The Gemara says explicitly in several places, if somebody comes to kill you, preemptive strike. You have to kill the person. As a matter of fact, tonight we're going to learn about many, many different factors. We're going to learn about self-defense. We're going to learn about preemptive strike. We're going to learn about the fact that, let's say, if you have only one influenza uh, vaccine, and it has to be given to many people. Are you allowed to allocate? Are you allowed to decide how to dispense, how to designate to who? We're going to discuss about if there's a missile that's coming, heaven forbid, if there's a missile that's coming and you have a power of diverting that missile, let's say with the Iron Dome or some kind of similar mechanism, some, some kind of identical type of technology, and that missile is coming and you could potentially, you can't stop the missile entirely, but somehow through radar, perhaps you could divert that missile. So either the missile will go to myriads of people, let's say thousands of people or hundreds of people, but you have a shaykhus to it somehow where you could divert that missile and instead of landing on hundreds or thousands of people, it could land instead on, let's say, one or two people instead. Are you allowed to choose to divert it from the hundreds to, let's say, to just one or two people? Let's say a person is driving a car. No one should ever be faced with this type of crisis. But let's say you're driving a car, and you realize that if you careen, if you swerve one way, then chas v'shalom a million times, lo aleichem, lo aleinu, so you'll kill let's say you'll bang into several people, but if you go to the right, then there's only one person over there. Are you allowed to choose to go on your own volition, voluntarily, to go to the right, where there will probably be one fatality versus going to the left, where there will be many fatalities? These are questions we're going to grapple with tonight. But let's go back to the text. Rashi, he says that he's afraid, Shema Yarigu Esacher, maybe he'll kill us. So Rabbi Shulayim Diskin says that he's afraid, perhaps, that he will kill, he will be killed, because the prophecy, what does it mean? Why is he afraid to kill other people? <laughs> if somebody comes to kill you, you're allowed to kill others. That's an explicit law. So some of Farshim want to say that this law only applies, and I'll tell you exactly, precisely, the Mepharshim that say this. My glorified special notes here. We could call it chicken scrolls. They always said I should have been a doctor because the doctor writes our prescription. He has his handwriting, you know, so they say, you know, I should have. Anyhow, but uh, so he says that this is actually brought down that from the Moshe of Zikainan, the Moshe of Zikainan says that Shema Yarugachem Varm. He says that perhaps he could have, instead of, let's say, maiming the person or really killing the person, he could have just maimed, let's say it was Esau, and maybe instead of just maiming him or handicapping, let's say, causing him a handicap and making him infirm or disabling him, he would actually kill him. And the halacha is, is that if you have the opportunity, if somebody's after you, and you have the opportunity to just, let's say, paralyze the person, or let's say, you know, you could take some kind of gun and shoot the person. You don't have to shoot the person when it by his main artery. Instead, you could shoot the person on the foot, so basically you're impeding the person's ability to be able to walk around or to run after you, to chase after you, and therefore you've stopped the person from their assault, but you didn't have to kill the person. So he was afraid that maybe, instead of just handicapping, instead of just disabling the person, he'll actually kill the person, and then he'll be chayev, he'll be culpable, he'll be responsible. However, it's not so partial because the Mishnah Lamelech and uh, also it's a Rivash, they, they say that the law, 
of maiming or handicapping or disabling a person that is an aggressor, a perpetrator, so that only applies that you have to maim or handicap the person, not kill the person. That only applies if it is a bystander that's witnessing somebody who's being attacked. In other words, let's say Ruvain sees that Shimon is attacking Levi, so then Ruvain is not allowed to kill Shimon, he has to rather just disable him. He's got to shoot him in a way, like shoot him in a limb that is not going to cause him death. However, Levi, who's being assaulted, Levi, who's been, thank you so much, Shalom. Levi, who's being attacked, is allowed to go ahead and he's allowed to kill him even if he has the opportunity just to maim him. And by the way, Halacha Lamaisa, this is a child that was asked about, let's say, about a burglary. Rahmal and Salon, somebody, you know, subject to a burglary, and you know, it's in Israel, let's say, and it could be even a Jew against Jew, tragically, right? That it could be that there are Jewish burglars or Jewish criminals. It's very, very sad, but unfortunately we've in many ways deviated from our values, and it does come up like this sometimes. So uh, are you allowed to go ahead and uh, do a preemptive strike against a burglar? So you say, may say, well, the burglar, you know, he's just a nice guy that needs some extra gelt, you know. He wants to feed his, uh, his marijuana habit or something. He's not, he doesn't even have a weapon. You know, he's just coming in to see if there's some cash. He saw that, you know, he was a delivery boy and he went into your house as a delivery boy and then he saw, oh, you got a nice, you know, Hanukkah menorah there. It's silver. I could pawn off the silver for some good money. You got to be careful for the delivery boys you let into your house, you know. You're not so simple. So then later on at night, he comes back and he's, uh, he, he realizes you have an open window. He's just going to take it. So the halacha is actually, is that you could assume that somebody that's intruding, somebody that's trespassing into your house has full intent of, God forbid, executing whatever they want to do, and they're willing to do it to the last breath, and therefore they will hurt you. And therefore you're allowed to get them before they get you, even if you think that there's a chance that they're not going to you know, hurt you at all. That's halacha. Okay? Uh, but uh, as far as this is concerned, the, uh, there, that's why it says he was afraid of killing others, because he's afraid, again, that maybe he's not supposed to kill the person, maybe he's just supposed to disable the person. That's one answer. However, there's a very deep answer that I want to share with you. And this is from the Nachlas Hamisha. Listen to what he says. He says that, says that Yaakov, Ayira Yaakov Ma'od. Yaakov was very, exceedingly frightened. All right? Ma'od. Very frightened. You ready for this? Listen to what he says. He says, why was he frightened? He says, because Esau is cruel, and Esau is an evil and wicked person, and Esau is de depraved, a promiscuous person, an immoral person, but Esau has a major schos, Esau has a major merit. And what is his major merit that he has? Is that for all the years, first of all, Yaakov was derelict in Kibbutz, not because that wasn't his fault, he, had a, he was a fugitive, he was a, he had a, he was a refugee, he had to run away. But Esau was around, and Esau took care of his father, especially, maybe his mother also to a degree, I don't know. But Esau took care of his father. He was good at Kibbutz of Ain. He was good at Kibbutz Av. We don't know about his relationship with his mother so much. We're not 100% certain about his relationship with his mother. And if you stay tuned to Shabbos, if everybody comes on Shabbos, I think that I'm going to speak about on Shabbos what Esau's relationship, which is shrouded in mystery, what his relationship with his mother was. But as far as his father, Kibbutz Av, he got a lot of spiritual dividends. He cashed in a lot of stocks. And he was very, very good, steadfast, and very meticulous about keeping Kibbutz up with his father. And therefore, he had a lot of schusim. By the way, by the way, listen to this. Says in Achaz Chamisha something utterly amazing. It's going to make you fall off your seat. So better put on your seatbelts right now. Nachos Chamisha says that if you take the word Ma'od, Vayira Yaakov, remember we said that Ma'od could be superfluous. Why does it have to say? The Torah doesn't mince any words. Why does it say Vayira Yaakov, that Yaakov was frightened? Ma'od, very. Because hey, Vayira Yaakov, Yaakov was frightened. Says in Achaz Chamisha that Ma'od is spelled Mem Aleph Dalet. How much is Mem? Mem is equal to? 40. Aleph is equal to 1. Dalet is equal to? You're all mathematical geniuses. What could we say? Oh. Mem Aleph Dalet is equal to total. It equals to? 45. 45. Wow. Let's take the letters Chaf, Yud, Bez, Fav Dalet. Chaf is 20. Yud is 10. Everybody help me out. Bez is 2. Fav is 6. Dalet is 4. How much are we up to? An Aleph of Vez, Kibbut Av, is equal to 45. Why was he frightened? Because Ma'od, because of Kibbut Av. That's where Yaakov was frightened. He says, listen, my life is in jeopardy. My life is at risk. I'm in peril. 
My brother, he's got a major schos. Ma'od, that's why he's very frightened. Because Ma'od represents the keep it off. You hear this amazing Kiddush, right? And if you never know, honoring and respecting parents is never easy, in most cases. But Yaakov was afraid that perhaps, perhaps, he may lose his life because Esau, the cruel, wicked guy, has major merit going on, and that is the fact that he honored his father. I once shared something for Rabbi Steinman, Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman, that's all. Rabbi Steinman said that if you look at the 21st century, you see something very peculiar, you see a unique phenomenon. And what is that? That people have longevity. Parents are living 90, 100, past 100. You never really had such longevity before. He says, what's shop? What's it all about? It's because they're so much healthier? Not because they're so much healthier. Listen, medicine is keeping people alive longer. He says, but there's another rationale. He says, there's a real reason behind it. And the fact is, those are living 90 and 100 in their youth. They probably didn't know so much about having vitamins and taking care of their health so much. He says, you know why? He says, because we're in the ikvist of the Mashiach. We're in the door of Mashiach. We're in the Messianic times right now. He says, and our... Objective, our mission, is to fight off any schos that Edom, that Esau has. And what's that schos that's lingering for him? What's that schos that's perpetual for Esau? <laughs> Kibbut of. He honored his father. So how do we win in this time of Mashiach when we have to fight the Edom? So therefore Hashem takes our parents and makes them live very, very long. And they become a burden. They become a hassle. They become, God forbid, to view it like that, but that's how so many people view it. And instead of viewing it as a hassle, instead of viewing it as a burden, you view it as a schus, that you, for you have to take care of them as long as possible, as many years as possible, and therefore, this is the antidote. This is to bring Mashiach. Can you imagine? This is going to go ahead and dispel. This is going to go ahead and this is going to eliminate all the potential merits that Edom has by you honoring your parents. Wow. And that's Ma'od. But we're up to now something even deeper. Ready for this? And we're just going to give Roger a chance to make himself comfortable. Okay, please, please pass the sushi. Don't tell me there's nothing left. No, that's all right. So many people here. What's going on? Okay, the fries, the beer. <laughs> so, so happy to see you, Roger. Yes. Okay, give him, please, please, whatever food we have. All right, we have to, we're going to have to order more food. Okay. Okay. So, we said that, that Jacob was, had a palpable fear. He was suffering mental anguish. He was extremely frightened and petrified because he was facing his mortal enemy, Esau, who was surrounded by 400 soldiers to kill him. And it says that he was afraid, Shema Yaharu Gacherim, that he, lest he have to kill others. We asked the question, why is he afraid of killing others? In, in combat, in war, and even in self-defense, the Jewish law is, is that preemptive strike is not only allowed, preemptive strike is encouraged. That that's what you should do. You should go ahead, and if you're being attacked, you have to attack first. Right, so therefore, so the question is, so why is he afraid of killing others? So I want to share with you something, a fascinating shot, a an amazing interpretation from the Sefer Pnei Yikarim. Okay, this is what he says. He says that Esau, he said that my brother Esau, uh, Yaakov said, my brother Esau, he may be evil, he may be wicked, he may be cruel, he may be immoral, he may be depraved, but he still comes from good stock. He still has a good genealogy. He comes from the same parents I do. He comes from Rebecca and Yitzchak, Isaac and Rebecca. He has some good qualities. He has to have some good qualities. And it could be that those qualities will manifest, that those qualities will shine in one of his future descendants. You hear this? And I'm afraid that if I kill him and he dies prematurely, that that will stifle, that will impede that will prevent a future generation from arising that will be good. This same deliberation, this same calculation was made by none other than Moshe Rabbeinu Moses. When Moses saw, remember Moses was the prince of Egypt. He was, uh, as a baby, he was basically abducted 
but his life was saved by Pharaoh's daughter, by the, by the princess. And he was raised in the royal house, which was a twist of irony and fate, because the same Pharaoh who was maliciously trying to do a genocide against all the Jewish males was raising the future Jewish redeemer an emancipator, the Messiah, in his own home, under his own nose, playing with him, cuddling him as his own child. Moshe goes out. He has a very strong conscience and a sense of morality. He goes out. He sees that the Jewish people are being beaten and the Jewish people are being harassed. And he sees one of the taskmasters, the Egyptian taskmaster, is beating his brother. And it says that before he kills, before he strikes, the taskmaster, the Egyptian taskmaster, he deliberates, he makes a calculation, and he probes with divine inspiration to see whether or not anybody will emanate from this Egyptian that will one day be a good person. And until he was able to conclusively determine the person's entire descendants and his entire pedigree, his entire genetic line in the future, he would not strike him. So listen to this. Says the Panini Mikorum, that the reason why Yaakov, Jacob, was afraid to kill Esau is because he said maybe somebody will come from him. And that's why he was afraid to call, kill Acherim, others. So the question is, why does it say that he's afraid to kill others? It should say he's afraid to kill Esau. It's not referring to Esau. It's referring to the descendant of Esau. And which specific descendant of Esau? I want to now uh, segue into a portion of the Talmud. It's in Tractate Horius. Horius deals with the laws of courts. And the laws of, we don't have papal authority in Judaism. We don't believe in papal infallibility. We believe that a rabbi, even the chief rabbi, and even the great judges and justices could make mistakes, and Horius deals with that. There's a segment of Horius that speaks about the great rabbi, Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir was a student of the most prominent, probably, rabbi of all time, Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Meir was also the teacher, in turn, of Rabbi Udanasi, the author of the Mishnah. Rabbi Meir suffered a terrible penalty for different reasons. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to really to extrapolate and really to delve into why Rabbi Meir was punished. But Rabbi Meir was punished. And in some, in sometimes his, instead of having an honorific Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir was exceedingly, exceedingly illustrious to the extent that any anonymous Mishnah, any anonymous legal authority, any anonymous legal ruling in the Mishnah is attributed to, when it's, when it's anonymity, it's attributed to Rabbi Meir. He was a great, great man. But he was punished because he tried to depose, he tried to unseat another great rabbi. He had his, obviously had his reasons. He was a very holy man. We're not in any way, in any way minimizing his holiness and suggesting that he did something wrong. I'm sure he, he had license for what he did. But nevertheless, he was punished. And therefore, at there were times in the Shas, in the times in the Talmud, when instead of being called Rabbi Meir, he's called Acherim, which means basically it's a pseudonym, but basically it means Acherim means others, and, and basically it's an insult because he's not being mentioned with his with his appropriate name, others. Instead, he's been called Acherim, the others. Okay, so now Rabbi Meir had a very very interesting background. He did not come from originally from a Jewish family. He was a descendant of none other than Nero, the famous Roman Emperor. If I'm not mistaken, I think Roman, lived, Roman Emperor Nero lived in 37 of the Common Era, CE. Um, he was the last of the Julian-Claudian uh, <coughs> Roman uh, um, uh, line. Uh, and Nero was the one that's brought down the Talmud Gittin, tracked again, if I'm not mistaken, around page 56, where it speaks about that Nero was sent by Vespasian to, um, to uh, shoot targets to shoot arrows in Israel, and every arrow went, and this, this was just a miraculous intervention, that every arrow went against Jerusalem. No matter where he shot it, he followed the compass, he did north, south, west, east, and everyone ended up in Jerusalem. And he understood, he was, he was intelligent and, and, and spiritually endowed enough, and tuned enough, intuitive enough to understand that something is erratic over here, that something is abnormal, that there's a higher authority guiding his actions. And therefore, he saw a Jewish child walking by, and he stopped the Jewish child. This is understanding that the Jewish children, the Gemara says, the Talmud says about Jewish children, that he no coat shall bait Rabban, that the small elementary school children, Hevel Piem, their very breath is what supports the existence of the world because their holiness, they're considered to be unsullied by sin, untainted, untarnished, they're considered to be 
pure and holy. And when they study Torah, there's no absolutely, there's no insincerity, there's no agenda. They're doing it from purity and innocence and holiness. And therefore, the custom back then was you would stop a little child and ask, what did you learn today? And he quoted, the child learned something from Ezekiel. It's very interesting because today in the yeshivas, unfortunately, they don't learn enough of the prophets. They're busy with Gemara, which is very important, Talmud, but they should also learn more of the prophets. And the boy quoted about the fact that the downfall of Edom, and obviously Edom referred to the Roman Empire, and, and, and all of a sudden he realized that this is no coincidence, it's not arbitrary. And this is a message to him. And he said, basically, God is trying to use me as an instrument, eventually, to destroy the Jewish people, but, but the consequence and ramification would be the destruction of, of the Romans. He says, I don't want to be his instrument. And he says, if God's using me, God's teaching me a message. The, the bottom line is that Nero ended up converting to, now, this is very contested and debated and disputed amongst all the historians, but the Jewish legend that we have, the Jewish tradition we have, is that Nero ended up converting to Judaism, and his great-great-great-grandson ended up becoming none other than Rabbi Meir. Now listen to this. This is going to be breathtaking. This is stunning. This is gorgeous, okay? When Rashi says that Jacob was, Yaakov was afraid of killing Esau, it doesn't say he's afraid of killing Esau. It doesn't say that. It should say he's afraid of killing Esau. It says instead he was afraid of calling Acherim. Why does it say Acherim? Because Jacob wasn't just looking to hear and now. A Jew always has Chacham, Eina Barosha, a wise man. He has his eyes and he always sees the future. He always ponders and probes what will be the consequences, what will be the repercussions, what will be the ramifications. And he saw, he said, Acherim, I'm afraid. Who's Acherim? Who does the Talmud refer to as Acherim? Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir, because Nero was a direct descendant of Esau. <laughs> And Rabbi Meir was a direct descendant of Nero. That means that Yaakov, Jacob, was afraid that if he kills Esau, he's stopping the birth, the eventual birth of Rabbi Meir. That's who he's afraid. He wasn't afraid of killing Esau. Esau deserved to be killed if he's going to be hostile and if he's going to be a combatant and be his adversary. But he was afraid of killing Acherim. Who's Acherim? Rabbi Meir. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Truly, truly amazing. Now, let's go further. The Torah says in the Chumash, if you go to page 170, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 177. I'm sorry, it's not 177. It's page 177, it is. Okay, the Torah says, Vayisu Yaakov Einov. Yaakov now, is, this is what he's dreading. This is what he's petrified of. He lifts his eyes, Vayar, and he sees Vihine Esav Ba. And Esav is truly calming. Esav does not retire. Esav doesn't quit. Esav is giving Imo Arba Meos Ish. And with him is an entourage of 400 soldiers. Vayachas as he loved him, Aleyav, Arachav, Ashteyashvachos. So what he does is he divides the children among Leah, Rachel, Leah, Rachel, and the, and the maidservants. And what does he do? Listen very, very carefully. Listen very carefully. Again, this is war. This is very, very dangerous. So what does he do? He puts the handmaids, the, the, that's referring to Bila and Zilpah, to the third and fourth wives. He puts them and their children first. It means in the front line of the battle, basically. And what does he do? Who does he put towards the back? Then he takes Leah Viladeha, Leah and her children, Achronim, he puts them towards the back. Ves Rachel, Ves Yosef, Achronim. Thanks so much. And then he puts Rachel and Yosef in the very, very back. Now, this is very, very troubling. Because he's playing favorites over here. Are we allowed to do that? I mean, everyone's life is in peril. We have people, their life is at risk. And he's choosing the ones that he likes more. To protect them, to put them outside of the direct target, and then taking his other children and wives and putting them. So let's look at Rashi. What does Rashi say? Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, the great Rashi. An acronym, Rashi stands for Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. That was his name. It was his, it was a patch. his father's name was Yitzchak, so was known as Yitzchaki. And um, otherwise, his acronym is Rashi. He's also Rabban Shal Yisrael, the rabbi of Israel, the rabbi of all of Israel. So Rashi says something fascinating. Let's see what Rashi says. Uh, Rashi says that the reason why he puts Leah and her children towards the back, and then Rachel and Yosef, Achron Achron Chaviv. Because Achron Achron Chaviv means that you leave the best for, his ex English expression, an English idiom, best for Last, right? In Hebrew, we say, Achron, Achron, Chavav, that most beloved is always at the end. Now, by the way, 
by the way. This is what a lot of people use when they're making, let's say, a party, and you know, they forgot to invite like, you, know, you, and they invited everybody, all your friends and all your relatives before you, and then you get the invitation the day of the wedding, they, they say, well, you know, it says, achron, achron, chaviv, that the beloved comes last. You know, this is always used as a good excuse, where you know, if you're honoring people, and then the last honoree, after everyone else gets all the honors, and, and or the entire audience basically left because it was such a long evening, and you leave the last guy, and you say, what do you mean? You know, the most beloved goes at the end, right? Leave the less, best for last. Well, it's 